You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 95 of Retired Racehorse Radio on the Horse Radio Network, part of Equine Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products and Cashel Company. Retired Racehorse Radio is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. Brought to you in cooperation with the Retired Racehorse Project and New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program. It's a new year and we're kicking it off talking with Dr. Shannon Reed on how to keep your winter training progressing even when you don't have an indoor arena. We are also joined by Kate Olson and Ann Steinbach from Second Stride to learn more about their efforts in thoroughbred aftercare. And last but not least, we catch up with Leandra Cooper from New Vocations to bring you our Adoptable Horse of the Week. Stay tuned. And they're off on Retired Racehorse Radio, the podcast that is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. This is Joy Orr in Detroit, Michigan. And this is Kristen Kovach-Bentley in Perky Omenville, Pennsylvania. And you're listening to Retired Racehorse Radio. Kristen, I got to say, I have literally never heard of Perky Omenville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> but I- yeah, it's a... Uh... I don't even know if it's a town, actually. Like, I could not tell you where downtown Perky Omenville is, uh, but I'm at my parents' house for the holiday. So you guys are listening to this in early January, but we are recording uh, in that nether space between Christmas and New Year's. So I'm enjoying a little Christmas vacation down here in Perky Omenville, Pennsylvania. I absolutely love that for you. And for most of you will be aware, maybe some of those in the Southern states didn't get hit quite the same way. <laughs> uh, but for those who were keeping track of what's new in the U.S. during Christmas, uh, we had some awful, awful cold weather hit us. So many people are taking your same route, Kristen, of catching up on their Christmases this week in our what would you call it? Kind of the, the loophole week of the year, I like to think. Like nothing's open, yet things are open. You have to pretend to work, but you're not really working. Right. Yeah. The best <laughs> thing I've seen is that meme that's like, you know, before Christmas, you're full of Christmas spirit. And after Christmas, before New Year's, you're just sort of confused and full of cheese. And that's pretty accurate. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> just kind of this this uh, weird purgatory of 2022 week that we're, we're all in yeah. until we... And 2022 just like couldn't, you know, like we're like, oh, 2022, it was so much better in so many ways, but it was like also kind of a another weird year and capping it off. I mean, with this, I'm like, still Christmas. bruised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally and figuratively, but, you yes. know, capping it off with this kind of winter weather was yeah, pretty in spirit for the rest of the year. So yeah, I was um, going to say, I'm like, it seemed pretty on brand. If you, <laughs> Yeah, honestly. Yeah. So, and I appreciate, I had listeners reaching out to me to make sure I was doing okay in the storm. Um, because of course, Jamestown is a little bit South of Buffalo. Uh, but anyone following the news, of course, knows that Buffalo was hit very, very hard. And there were mm-hmm. a lot of fatalities in that storm and it was really, really rough on Buffalo. So I appreciate everyone who reached out to see if I was okay. That really made me feel nice that you guys were saying hello and checking in, but we made out pretty well. It was off like awfully cold <laughs> and yes. not very nice out, but we did not get like seven feet of snow in Jamestown, New York. So we were, we did okay. It was a tough weekend for sure. And I'm glad that we put off our travel plans because I really didn't want to make my house and horse sitter deal with that. Um, no, and just me, the so. stress too of, it was awful. you know, I, I had my horse and she's 15 minutes out of boarding barn. So it's not terrible. But there's still that worry of colic and stress and making sure that they have access to water and no one's getting too cold. So I have a phenomenal barn manager and great, there's a great team there. And so they were making sure that the horses were getting warm brand mash and everyone was getting checked and the water troughs were getting checked to make sure nobody had frozen water. Um, luckily like my horse is pasture. They have like one of those automatic waters, but it has a ball in it. And oh, one okay. of the horses thought they were, it's great. Cause like in the winter, it doesn't freeze over because they're constantly cracking it. But, uh, one of the horses thought she was super, super clever. And she would just push the ball into the side of the tank and just always have access to the water. <laughs> <laughs> So that was really fun for me to go dig out. <laughs> yeah. Like, thanks, buddy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we made out okay. The horse water stayed open. Um, I had so much hay out that they actually didn't touch their new hay bags. 
for about 48 hours oh, after I, I put those out. <laughs> so they made out well. We did have uh, the cow barn froze up a little bit. So there's some ongoing mm-hmm. water woes there. Um, unfortunately, it warmed up enough on Saturday that I brought my dog to the barn, uh, my border collie, Sage. And she, within five minutes, pointed out a burning extension cord in the cow barn oh my to my, <laughs> my sister-in-law's dog. boyfriend. Yeah, <laughs> we were like, good girl. Yeah, he came over to the horse barn. And he's like, you got to give Sage a cookie. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, she just, she was circling and staring at this smoking extension cord that he yes. hadn't noticed yet. And he was like, she just saved the farm. And it was on Christmas Eve. So we're like, Sage is the dog who saved Christmas. So now we have our script for the next Hallmark movie. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It'll be a children's book. Sage, the dog who saved the farm. So. I love that. Sage, who saved Christmas. It'll be <laughs> she so did. cute. She's so a good cute. girl. So. Honestly, though, it's like, what's the thing you need last to deal with besides negative temps, crazy snow and wind, a barn fire? Like, right. you don't need yeah, no everything thing. hitting you at one time, you know? Yeah, that's Just... enough, like, calamity for one day. So, yes. yeah. Yes. Let Keep it in threes. Keep it in threes. Cold, right. wind, snow. Done. We're there. <laughs> yeah, we're good. So, uh, you know, it's funny because where we're sitting now, I'm looking ahead at the weekend forecast and it's going to be super warm. And by the time this episode mm-hmm. comes out, people are going to have completely forgotten that the storm ever happened. So you're welcome for the reminder, folks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just, you know, retired resource radio reminding you of your winter trauma. Yep. But, you know, we're going to make it better. I'm very excited for our guest today, Kristen, that we have Dr. Shannon Reed joining us. She's phenomenal. She's been on before. But for those who may not have the luxury of going to Ocala, Florida, like I constantly dream every single winter or any of our Southern friends, um, and we actually have to deal with the snow and ice and frozen mud, um, Dr. Shannon Reed's going to come on and tell you about some ways that you can keep your horses safe and healthy and fit during the winter, even if you don't have access to an indoor arena. And we're also talking to Second Stride too, who's kind of taking aftercare to the next level. They're, I was really impressed when I went through their website, but I think we'll save save all the, the hints and tricks for our listeners soon because they have some fun stories to share with us as well. But before we dive into all of that, we're going to hear from our premier sponsor, Kentucky Performance Products. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. If you've ever had a horse with diarrhea, you know what a frustrating problem it can be. Finding an ingredient that works to dry up the diarrhea becomes a high priority. It turns out that researchers have found one, a yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii. It has been proven to improve and halt episodes of diarrhea. It supplies specific nutrients to the lining of the small and large intestines, and these nutrients promote healing of irritated tissues. It also supports improved starch and sugar digestion in the small intestine, reducing the opportunity for imbalances to occur in the hindgut. Nalox Advanced, made by Kentucky Performance Products, contains Saccharomyces boulardii, along with a blend of fermentation solubles and stomach buffers. Nalox Advanced is recommended for horses of any age that are suffering from diarrhea. It also supports a healthy digestive tract in horses at risk for gastric or colonic ulcers, such as performance horses or any horse that is constantly on the go and exposed to stressful situations. For best results, Nalox Advanced should be fed on a daily basis. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Well, Joy, we have back with us again today a listener favorite, Dr. Shannon Reed. She's a clinical associate professor of large animal surgery at Texas A&M University. You can find her full bio in our show notes. Uh, One update is that she is now a member of the RRP board. So welcome to the board, Dr. Reed, and welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So today uh, we are chatting about, this was actually a listener request. We've had uh, people reaching out to us asking for advice and ideas um, for what to do to keep your horse kind of progressing in training in the winter, especially if you don't have an indoor arena. Um, And the reason that we reached out to Dr. Reed to help us is that um, you and I, Shannon, 
used to actually do this as a webinar for the RRP, for the trainer group, um, you know, because there's a lot of folks in the northern part of the country who were starting their thoroughbreds for the makeover, um, you know, who are up in the snow belt and watching all the people down in Aiken and Ocala having a grand old time riding around in the sun. Uh, so we would always add this webinar, you know, kind of in like late winter um, to help people kind of keep that training going. Cause there's really a lot you can do, even if you don't have a good place to ride your horse to keep that training and that development moving forward. Um, so that's a little bit what we're going to tackle today. So Dr. Reed, you're down in Texas now, so it is a little warmer than when you used to be up in Ohio, uh, but what is your riding situation like at home now? Well, um, my riding situation like at home is I do not have an arena. I certainly have a flat area of my pasture and I have jumps and stuff set out in a grass field. Uh, problems I run into definitely in the winter is I run out of light. And right now you cannot get an electrician to save your life. So I keep waiting to put on lights and don't have them. So when I run out of dark or out of light, I am in the dark. So I'm either trying to say, can I ride with a headlamp? Can I ride by a full moon? Um, and then if there's rain, certainly the floor, the footing does get pretty slick or it gets pretty hard. So I do not have an arena. And I do not have lights right now. Uh, and, and that is my limitations. But I do have jumps in a grass field and a flat area. And I can yeah. haul. That's the oh, only okay. thing I can do is I can haul into places. Um, but that's if people don't mind me coming at like nine o'clock at night because of work. Right. Yeah. And yeah. like up where I am in New York, like I just try not to haul in the winter much just because of the amount of salt yep. on the roads. I don't want to yes. eat my trailers. <laughs> so I tend to not do a ton of hauling. I also then have to like dig it out of the snowbank that it's parked in, which slows me down a little bit. But I would imagine yeah. in Texas, your hauling opportunities are probably vast that you have. Also they, they, they are actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are vast. And it, it's, um, it's a good cross training because a lot of times I'm in the arena with some ropers and some rainers and there's a flag running up and down the wall and my thoroughbreds are like, okay, then <laughs> just pick up a little cutting on the side. It'll be fun. It's good for them. <laughs> we can push cows with the best of them. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. So in a very similar scenario, I think most listeners know at this point, I also don't have a ring ride on grass and yeah, the footing is always a big concern. So it's either slick and I'm tearing up what's going to be my summer pastures or it's rock hard and then it's too hard to ride on or it's snow and then my horses are insane. So those are my options like <laughs> slippery, hard or nuts. So, um, so to work around some of that, like, oh, my horse is a little nutty and I don't have a safe place to work him. Um, there's all sorts of different strategies that we can do. And one thing I always add is like, Joy always says I'm like a very badass cowgirl and I'm really not. Like if my horses are fresh and I'm out in the middle of a field somewhere, I don't want to ride that. Like I, I don't need to die today. So, so I do kind of go back to groundwork a lot of the time, um, you know, or like different creative places and ways to ride where I'm not putting myself in that scenario where I'm going to get like bolted for home with. <laughs> Um, how about you, Dr. Reed? You know, I don't know what your spread is like. Do you have a lot of places where like you might get a little barn sour, herd sour or? Um, mine can see each other and work like my, I have this like triangle shaped acreage where I don't necessarily get the, the, the barn sour, but I certainly get into places where I'm like, this footing is not footing I want to pick a fight on. Um, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm familiar and with that. <laughs> depending upon, yeah. So I, I think, I, I think you just exposed one of our themes for today is there's going to be a lot of discussion about stuff that happens out of the saddle, but I think that's good. But no, I don't, I don't necessarily have as much, I get a little buddy sour sometimes and I actually yeah. run into trouble with the other horse spinning around and being a turd where I have locked them up than necessarily the horse I'm riding. And that can get to the point where I'm like, they are going to wreck my fence. Um, yeah. So I do have the, when I had two horses and now even the three I have, sometimes the others act up more than the one I'm riding that causes the problem. Yeah. And then you get into that, like one more potato chip scenario, right? Like I have yeah. four right now, so that's fine yeah. because there's always, you should get a goat two or that three. Adds in no. a half a potato I will chip. say though, like adding <laughs> in, so I, I do have access to an, an indoor, which I feel very privileged to have, but it's also the only place you can ride. Mm -hmm. And so it gets crowded and then yeah. you still get a fresh horse. <laughs> who can come in and be squirrely. And sometimes it's your horse, which I go to groundwork as well. But when it's not your horse and you're in the arena with that other horse, 
it's um your horse learns to pick up on that energy really quick in the winter i feel like as opposed to summer yeah especially if one is like you know, like your horse is fresher than you thought and then one comes in and sets that one off you know it's yes. like oh. i recently had that one i'll share that on another story when i'm ready to not swear <laughs> <laughs> and that's where that like fair yeah you know, and again, I'll always add this disclaimer, like I'm not a professional trainer. I just train my own horses. Mm -hmm. But in that kind of scenario, I'm always thinking, you know, like if I get out somewhere and it's dicey footing and I'm not going to pick a fight like loping circles to try to lope a horse down because it's like two feet of snow and I don't know where the holes are. You know, I will still keep the horse in front of your leg, keep him in front of your hand and keep the feet moving. But just if you're in charge of that movement and that direction, generally you can't get into too much trouble. Um, and then I pick my battles. Like if I'm yeah. like, okay, this is going great. This is going wonderful. We're going to go home right now before this gets worse. Yeah. Um, so definitely there's times where like, okay, I just don't come in with a real big agenda. You know, you're just out to get the horse moving, get the feet moving, you know, in jobber's case, like clear up those stocked up legs and then we're going to call it a day. Before. I definitely don't worry about collection <laughs> as much as I do during the warmer months. Like yeah. I'm not trying to get, it's nice when it happens. Don't get me wrong. I'm like sitting here praising to every God out there for the moment, but, um, winter draft syndrome's a thing and that that's fine. That's fine. You're right. <laughs> so I think yeah, one important sure. thing to emphasize is that like, you're not going to get a horse like eventing fit in the winter mm -hmm. if you don't have a good safe place to ride. And I think goal setting is a really important thing for those winter months. Like you can progress your training and progress your conditioning in many ways, but I think you just have to be pretty realistic about what you're going to achieve. Um, so Dr. Reed, with that in mind, what are some like groundwork things you like to do? Like, let's say the footing is bad for riding, but you can safely get a horse around the property. What might you do on a day where you're like, okay, if this horse needs to get out and do something and I'm going to move this horse forward, but I'm not going to be able to ride it. What are your yeah. go-to's? Well, I'm actually, I'm even going to back us up a half a step because yeah. I think what's really important that I've learned going into winter, and I just did this with my new horses, I think now is a really good time to take stock and sit down with a notebook and a piece of paper and start just journaling out or texting out, what does your horse do? Like, what do you like about where they're at right now? And what do you not like about what they're at right now? And that includes everything. Does my horse pick up their feet for their farrier? Do they tie by the trailer? Do they load in the trailer? Do they when we're talking about collection issues, is that because I can't get them to go forward or because they're not moving off of my leg or they're not giving? So I think it's, to me, it would be really important. I just did this with the horse that I'm planning to work over the winter is to sit down and write it all out, like the holes of everything. And this is not in a way to depress yourself, but in a way to like, okay, <laughs> here's all the things that may have a consistent theme. And so I get, I get student evaluations all the time, right? And as an instructor getting student evaluations, sometimes it's a little brutal. Oof. But what I will do with those is I'll sit down and I'll be like, where do I see the theme? Okay, I see a theme here that I'm not connecting with my students. Or I think you could do the same thing with your horse. Sit down with your horse and give them a student evaluation of them. And just be like, this is where it's at. Because I'm going to pick my exercises based on what that list looked like. So if my list looked like okay, when I get into a busy, crowded warm-up arena at my three-day event, I had this with one of my thoroughbreds, he bolts, he's crazy, the first 10 minutes are just obnoxious. I, that is not something I want to keep doing. And so now, um, if I were in that crowded arena, I wouldn't even plan on getting on, but I would get him with a rope halter or a chain and we would learn to stand still in the corner. Um, so now if I'm outside and I have a horse like I have now, um, this older horse who's a little stiffer through his body, I've got this list of things that say, I need this horse to yield to pressure and to move off of my leg. So if I'm going to take him around out in the field, we're going to spend a lot of time asking him to do those things from the ground. So maybe I'm going to walk around with a rope halter and a lead rope, and I'm going to have a dressage whip, not to use it as a whip to drive him forward, but to move him away from pressure. So I'm going to sit down, I'm going to make a list of what are the small things that my horse does, or even bigger things that are keeping me from smiling when I'm with them all the time, <laughs> give them that student evaluation. And then I get out in the field and I'm going to say, what are the holes that when you really break them down to the building blocks, I can address from the ground. And maybe it is keeping the legs moving until you tell them to stop. Maybe it's that you can't even get on your horse from the mounting block and they walk off. So you spend one day a week 
just sitting at the mounting block until they're quiet and then you're done. So I'm going to pick my ground exercises. I think now that I've done this for a little while, I know that I'm going to be limited in the winter of what are the holes I want to fill over the winter that are going to be the small things that make my life easier when I get back at it for fitness. That's super smart. And that's like something I've always thought about like like okay my goal for the year let's say is to you know be able to side pass a log i'm not going to start out by trying to side pass the log i'm going to start out by making sure i'm getting a couple of lateral steps you know and those are the kinds of things you can install over the winter if you chunk it down to that little tiny baby step so that's super smart you know is to lay out where your horse is at what your goals are for the year and then you know kind of that smaller roadmap on how to get there yeah. and it it might be that i never even leave this doll like i honestly could say you know what every time i go to tack my horse up he's cinchy at the girth he hates being groomed and so i'm going to spend a half an hour grooming him slowly enough until we've gotten to the point where he starts to accept it and i'm going to within the stall while I'm grooming him, I'm going to groom him in his bridle. And then I'm going to ask him to give to the rein and step over in the middle of grooming him. And then I think you can, I honestly think you can do when I remind myself, I can do a lot in my horse's stall to ask them to respect my space or to move over or to stand still or to focus different or, or practice a whole bunch of little things. So I, I think you can even do building blocks in a 12 by 12 stall. Which is really convenient, you know, if you're somewhere where your driveway is icy and you can't get a horse out of the barn or, you know, your horse hasn't gotten a lot of turnout and, you know, there's just nowhere to go. Um, Because I definitely get some spots like that sometimes in the winter where it'll be kind of warmish during the day. So the driveway thaws. And then when I actually make it to the barn, it's already refrozen into an ice sheet. So, So I can't get a horse out of the barn, but there's still all sorts of stuff like that you can still do in the barn. That's really useful. So... I'll add things like, you know, learning how to ground tie, even if you're not, you don't think you're ever going to be in a position where you're going to quote unquote need to use that. It's just one of those things that makes a horse well-rounded. So you might also think about things like learning to hobble. Um, Again, not ever something you might need to use, but it's a good skill on horses who are accustomed to something like that are less likely to panic if they get into a, you know, tangled in a fence situation or something like that. Um, In the winter, I do a lot, even if I can't, ride ride i will rope the dummy a lot so even if you're an english rider and you're like i I don't need to rope (laughs) if your horse is very accustomed to ropes and things swinging past their head that's only ever a good thing so all sorts of stuff you can do without actually having to go out and ride ride so awesome i think the problem i run into is i sort of gave myself a going to the olympics pressure of winter and in reality winter can really be the building blocks for the whole rest of the year and i needed to realize that Everyone that's around me is in the same winter I'm in. So there's no rush. True. Right. Yeah, we'll all get there in the end. I know. I do love that. I feel like winter is such a great time to like humble yourself, slow down and get clear about what you want when you start Mm -hmm. getting into, you know, the fast pace of show season or maybe you're bringing a new horse on. So there's more off sites. The days may be longer in the summer, but I swear they go by so much faster. Sometimes yep. it's refreshing too to not like have to ride every day, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think I, my goal is like maybe one to two rides a week. But most of it's going to like I just want to be on the ground with my horse and really give her some solid foundations for the year. Right. So yeah, so that's always something you can do is, you know, spend the time work on like Shannon said, you know, the grooming giving to pressure in the stall, stepping over, moving off a little pressure just in the barn aisle or out in the field. Um, If you do have access to, like, let's say a nice big pasture and your horse handles well, um, I love hiking with a horse. Mm. Not necessarily hiking, like going up and down Mm. a mountain, um, but going out and just going for a long walk. So anyone who is like roughly familiar with how they condition yearlings for the yearling sales, you know, those are sometimes seven figure horses and they condition those by hand walking. So you can actually really get quite a lot done with a good hand walk. Um, And one thing that's important with that is like, that's a, like a walk, walk, like you're not like ambling along looking at birds. Um, I mean, you can still look at birds too, but like, you should be getting warm too. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You (laughs) want to be warm as the person you want that horse really stepping up into their tracks. Um, If you can get that horse to stretch down and forward, that helps build top line. Um, Of course, do that safely. If you get out there and your horse is a kite, like maybe, maybe don't start with a hike 
on the full perimeter of your property, you know, start a little closer to the barn and make your orbit a little bigger every time. So, um, but yeah, walking is great. That keeps you warm and fit, keeps your horse warm and fit. And that really does put a lot of conditioning on a horse for sure. Shannon, you used to walk around the neighborhood in Ohio, right? Like up and down the street and look at. <laughs> yes, I Really? Did. Oh my gosh. I, we would I stop at every photo. mailbox. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I have one. We would stop. Garbage day was the best day because we could like approach obstacles and it just made for a different, like a better show environment when we first went to a show as we just walk up and down the neighborhood and inspect things. And, um, you know, it would sometimes take us 20 minutes to get a half mile, you know, total distance but that was because we were dealing with everything along the way in a positive manner um i i i had a horse that i took him to rp and we had probably a total of maybe five months total of prep and i would say three of that was walking um oh. in some form or another on the ground we didn't spend much of it in the saddle and i he ended up doing really pretty solidly but we just we bonded pretty well in that time. He learned to deal with a lot of stuff on those walks. And the other thing is, I don't think any of us should hit spring and want to get our horses fit without having some degree of fitness for ourselves that we've achieved. So right. that certainly mm-hmm. helps there. I love that. Yeah. I, I didn't even think about hand walking like that. I think I'm going to start adding that into my daily routine. So thank you both for that. Uh, but it did maybe think too, we talked about having goals for the year, but Would you also agree, Dr. Shannon, that it's good to look at where, like what gaps your horse has too, and can you address them Mm -hmm. over winter? Because I feel like whenever we talk about gaps, it's always going back to those foundations, your ABCs in a way. No, I think that when you kind of made me think about two things is there's different gaps. Like, let's say you came to the end of your season in the fall and you're like, you know what? We were tired. We were stiff. We were this you you should have your vet out and mm-hmm. your vet should look at your horse now. Maybe they're not going to do any injections or anything like that, but they may say, you know, this horse actually looks good. I think it's fine. You just need to lay off or boy, this horse really flexes positive to here. Let's take the x-ray now, like have your vet out now and mm-hmm. get them examined so that you can look and see, is there anything that's going to need time rehab and injections? Cause then you got a whole three months ahead of you where you're already hand walking or they may say this horse's back is really stiff. Why don't you spend some time hand walking in a Pessoa or things like that. So I, I think your holes in your training or your gaps of like what you want to achieve. My horse doesn't stay on the trailer, but also I was thinking about this when we were prepping to come into here is the pre winter or start of winter veterinary visit. I don't think that can be undersold, like have your vet out, get a quick jog in and have them look at it and be like, but you know, this looks good. Just come back at it. Or let's do this while we have this time period off. And so there's mm-hmm. that, type of gaps and then there's just what you're talking about like the gaps of you know every time I go the mounting block I can't get on and that's not that big of a deal until it is if you're at a show and you start the whole thing tense because you can't get on your horse if you're anything like me sometimes I can't get myself back from that tension of ripping across the arena doing you know farting and bucking and then trying to calm down and go in and enter square is it's not good so that you're right two gaps health gaps and behavioral gaps or performance gaps yeah 100% i love that so and so much of this you know does not require walking trotting and cantering for <laughs> 45 minutes in a ring so it I think a large part of this is just learning how to get creative with what you have um and of course being safe i think are <laughs> two guiding principles, you know, yeah. don't go out. If you're on an ice rink, don't go out and be like, all right, cool. Well, we're going to long line today. Like, yeah. no, don't go out in um, negative temps. <laughs> like if you don't have to yeah. like be smart. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, actually, cause... that's a good point. Like joy, what is your bottom limit for training where you are uh, in terms of, so it, it depends what it's going to be. So I don't ride under 20 degrees. Um, I'm not, I'm never going to put my horse where they have to breathe in that cold air. Like when it becomes hard for me to breathe in it, if I were to go running, I'm not going to make my horse do that because they take in so much more than I do. Um, but to do like hand walking to work maybe on manners and the cross ties, things like that, normally under like 10 degrees for me. I'm from Michigan, so my my levels are going to be a bit more extreme than other people. Um, but yeah, under 10 is my cutoff just for my own safety and my horse's comfort too. Yeah. How about you, Dr. Reed? 
And is this um, like location dependent a little bit too? Yeah, I think it is a little bit. But one thing I would say is there your 20 degree cut is not a bad cutoff in your mind because there is, this is where I'm going to science out. There is some research that the neutrophils and the other cells in the lungs and the cilia in the lungs that are moving debris and things along that they start to change their function at 20 degrees Fahrenheit and below. And Ooh, so that approved. Walk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, can walk, you can do things, but anything that's going to require clearance of dust, debris, coughing, phlegm, saliva, breathing hard, um, the the function is going to change. Now we all know there's Norwegian trotters out there, mm-hmm. or there that that's maybe an exception to the rule, except for it's not. You know, they they run into bleeding and things like that too. So that 20 degree Fahrenheit mark is a good at least at least hard work line. Is that you shouldn't have a huge amount of hard work going on below 20 degrees, especially in indoor arenas where there's a lot of dust and things like that to clear it. Um, and that, that that's a nice cutoff to have, um, just to give yourself a mind. It's like below this, just things stop working like they should. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I feel pretty good because that's about where we stop. I don't, we might not even ride under like 22 and like yeah. a sunny 22 is different from a cloudy 22. As and well. I'm, so. I might hop on like bareback and get her to move her legs. And we're just doing like a big swinging walk under 20 yeah. but i, I really but don't not, want yeah, her like, heart rate up and breathing hard like we're not right. doing a big ground pole day or flat work day or even incorporating crossovers like none of that <laughs> yeah i'm glad you mentioned ground poles that's uh and i don't even own any ground poles we use old fence posts yeah <laughs> but it's still it's on the ground and i have been known to make like a cavaletti riser out of snow um, like build a little like snowball. That's a good one. I on used those. to use buckets because th- there was a time I didn't have an indoor and I used to just grab the old slash broken buckets that yeah, for some reason I wouldn't safe, throw away. Like, you know, yeah. If it's just, if it's not something that your horse is going to get cut up on or hung up in, yeah. like, there is nothing wrong with a little redneck ingenuity <laughs> to make up, <laughs> make up some, uh, some training tools. Cause I was like, well, I don't need to go buy risers. I'll just make a little snow mountain here. And then you, you can adjust the height and, uh, yeah, that works out pretty well. So, you know, I will we'll walk a horse over a raised pole or just a pole flat on the ground. Um, with one pole, you can teach them to side pass over it. Uh, or like in Wes's case, our little standard bread, he is so funny about his knowing where his feet are. A big deal for him is just standing quietly straddling that pole. Mm. Um, you can do that really cool thing where you teach them to walk oh, over gosh. the pole long way. <laughs> yes. Uh, which is a big challenge. So yeah. that's a lot of fun. And, you know, you do that in hand for sure before you start doing that under saddle. Uh, if you raise that pole, then of course they're really engaging, you know, their core and their hind end to step over that. Um, and then I've also found that, you know, if you are up in the snow belt, if you are safe in the snow, like deep snow works about as well as a raised pole. But of course you just have to be mindful of how much you're working in it. Um, but I have hiked my horse around in deep snow before because it really gets his stifles in particular working and he's got some sticky stuff. I so. love having um, deep snow for snow. horses. Like when I first got Astrid, which you know she's my first thoroughbred, there's a lot to learn. Um we had the polar vortex that year and it mm. played in my favor too. <laughs> she was less likely to just try to run around aimlessly when we had giant snow drifts. So I just had her walk calmly through them she had the resistance, which also built up her legs. They never kept anything too intense, but it gave me some security as well. And it doesn't hurt to fall in the yeah. snow. I also found that out and that was nice. <laughs> yeah, it's it's even easier than falling in like, you know, on a water jump. It's it's nice to land in the snow. <laughs> it sure is. Like of all the falls, I will fall in snow anytime. Like that's that sounds great. <laughs> Yeah, I think keeping them below the sweat threshold is yeah. probably mm-hmm. very reasonable for really cold days because that's when you start to get into changes, especially with older horses or whatever. If you have a long coat, you don't want to clip it just so you can work them when you really can't work them. I think we have to be honest with ourselves when we're clipping our horses. Like if you're body clipping your horse, you better be riding five to six days a week. Otherwise, right. you can trace clip or not at all and keep it down low, you know. But now yeah, I think hard deep to justify. snow, yeah. deep soft snow without water running underneath it. Cause you've all, we've all run into that where you're like, I did not know there was a stream there. And now my horse does not trust me. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely pastures Known I pudding. don't go in. Yeah, yeah for exactly. sure. For sure. But, yeah. The yeah. crop, the crop fields are pretty good because you know that that's been flat. So yeah. I yes. stick to those. I do. I do want to touch base on the sweat thing really quick because I think you can go the opposite extreme too. So there's clipping, of course, but there's always the rider who assumes their horse is just as cold as they are. And you can over blanket and like, or have your quarter sheet on and your horse actually has quite a fluffy coat and you probably don't need it. Mm -hmm. And you create the problem of sweat. I don't know how often that really happens, but I do keep that in mind personally. Yeah. And I think the quarter sheets are mostly for our fashion sense. Like I own (laughs) one in Texas because I think it looks cute sometimes, but there were some times in Ohio where I felt like it was cold enough and I wanted to walk that I felt like I was keeping their muscles a little bit warm, but you're absolutely right. Like we don't need to, we don't need to blanket them into sweating. <laughs> that is yes. definitively not what should be going on. No, for sure. I mean, I, my horse tends to get a, a tight booty, so I'll use a quarter sheet on like colder days. Like we're in like 20 to 25. Cause I use, um, like absorbing or something like some sort of, um, uh, like a menthol product on her to help loosen her muscles. Otherwise she complains about her tight booty the whole time. And uh, so I'll put the quarter sheet over that to kind of insulate some of that heat, but she also doesn't really get a coat. But I see some of our students come out in quarter sheets and they have woolly mammoths they're riding. And and then the horse ends (laughs) up sweaty. (laughs) But they look so cool. I'm guilty of that too. Cause I ride Gandalf a lot, our Irish sport draft in the winter because he is very reliable and doesn't do dumb stuff the way the thoroughbreds do (laughs) and i have that big wool skirt thing that acts Mm -hmm. like a quarter sheet so of course i feel like a princess because he's a nice big pretty horse with a big forelock and then he's like i'm sweaty so yeah it's mostly for me (laughs) and i admit that (laughs) take the quarter sheets off if you don't really need them yes (laughs) they are cute they are cute you don't need them though most most of us don't need them I have used mine probably twice. Yeah. Especially here in Texas, yeah. but you never know. I like, you know, I, I could probably use it. If I want to really go into a Western bar and have them stare at me, <laughs> I will put on my quarter sheet and four white leg wraps and I will ride my 17 to thoroughbred in at a speed of lightning. And <laughs> Listen, like... sometimes you have to assert yourself. You have to assert yeah, your dominance. You... <laughs> you just assert your dominance like i will dressage all over you people look at this hey you can come up to my racehorse ranch anytime we are <laughs> we don't mind of course that's the problem while, is you also don't have an arena here and it's no fun at all so after a while i think they're just like oh, there's that chick again here she <laughs> comes <laughs> Exactly. All right. Well, I hope that this answers some of the questions that listeners um wanted to have answered um there's I mean, there's a ton of things you can do. It's just the hard part is getting creative and finding the safe ways to do mm-hmm. it. Um, so what I think we'll also do is after this episode airs on uh, January 10th, I'll go back and I'm going to find recordings of the webinars when Dr. Reed and I used to do these for the RRP and we'll share those as well because we have a ton more ideas um, in those webinars, like, you know, just for exercises and stuff to do. But I think the like the TLDR is, you know, be safe, <laughs> uh, be smart, <laughs> you know, and just, yeah, don't get yourself in trouble and get creative, but there's lots and lots of ways to keep your horse mentally and physically engaged in the winter. Yeah. That's I'm gonna, stay I'm humble. Steal something. I'm going to steal something from one of my Peloton instructors that I love. She says no ego amigo all the time. Oh. <laughs> and I think winter is the no ego amigo time. You take mm-hmm. yourself out of it. You just chill, you breathe and you got no, you get to, you get to fix a whole ton of things for your horse. So no ego amigo. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I'm going to change my new year's resolution and yeah, borrow what Dr. Reed said about actually going through and writing down all the holes in our training and yeah. see if I can fill them in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, uh, That's, that's a little bit what I was doing with my post on RP is like, I gotta make, we gotta make some goals for the Mr. Nephro Spunnik. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Reed, thank you very much once again for joining us on today's show. And uh, yeah, we're going to look forward to seeing what all of our listeners get up to this winter. So if you guys uh, got some cool ideas from this episode or come up with your good ideas, definitely tag us on social media and we'll share them with Shannon too. And we'll see what you guys get up to. Awesome. Well, I'm here with Tony from Cashel. You all know it from the ads you hear all the time on this show. But I we're at the trade show and this is the p- point of time in the year where we find out what's new coming out. So what's Cashel have new coming out? 
Oh, we've got a, a great lineup of uh, 32, 34 wool top pads. So uh, describe them. Uh, five different colors, real vibrant, bright, sharp looking pads. What, are the, what makes them different? Uh, well, it's the fill. The, the, the wool felt on the inside is a natural felt. And the fleece on the bottom is a hundred percent merino. Oh, really? Okay. So th- these are soft and squishy pads. Well, not real squishy, but soft, and and they do absorb shock and and saddle fit. What do they retail for? What are those? That's you about a hundred and nineteen. That's the right price. Yeah. Anything else new with Cashel coming out? Oh, we've got uh, more saddle pads coming in the fall. A uh, new strap line coming in the fall. It's uh, a two tone that looks great with a, a great buckle set on it. There's, we're always in development, so there's so many things, projects in the works. What's still your most popular product? Is it still always the same things year after year? Uh, fly. You bet. Yeah. Fly, fly that's what we all do. That's, that's how I knew you in the first place was fly. Fly masks. Yep. Yeah. Many years ago, uh, we were primarily fly masks and kind of had some tush cushions and a few odds and ends. Today, we've broadened that offering to saddlebags, uh, Strap, head stalls, breast collars, bell boots, um, leg protection, and the, the it continues to grow. Is there a place where somebody can go and see all the products? Uh, Cashelcompany.com will give you a good offering. There you go. Well, thank you, Tony. It's been fun seeing you again. Hey, thank you. Good to see you. Well, Kristen, it's the new year. Lots of new things are happening, including a new RRP thoroughbred makeover competition. It never, never ends. ends. It <laughs> the never cycle ends. Just it's a continuous turning. cycle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, even though the makeup itself is in October, but we start the application process now because, of course, it is you know a a long um, part of the year. It's a, a long process. It's about a 10-month retraining process. But of course, it, by applying to the makeover, you get access to all of the RRP services um, and education to help you along on that journey. So um, even if you're not sure, you know, if you don't think, oh, I don't think I'm going to be very competitive or, you know, I just don't know if I want to do it. If you apply and you're accepted, you get access to all of that, including our super supportive trainer community. It's a private Facebook group and it's a really positive space where people just come and bounce ideas off of each other, um, you know, share struggles that they're having. And it's just a good place where, you know, people are not nasty. People don't judge. Um, so really that makeover process is just such a good way to build that first year of retraining for a horse. So whether you're a professional trainer who gets thoroughbreds in and out all the time, um, or you're a, you know, a team rider, like we've had in the past, um, Natalie Holdren last year was a great example. She was our featured mm-hmm. makeover team rider, um, or you're a, like a bucket list. This is my one chance, my one horse. I'm going to do this thing. Like our makeover trainer from last year, Lee, um, and now is very the time. amateur friendly. Yes, exactly. Now is the time to get those applications in. The application process uh, is open for submissions now. So it was open starting on January 2nd through the 20th. So you're running out of time. (laughs) If you're thinking about it, uh, now is the time. Get that application in, um, pay that application fee, and then you don't need to have a horse right now. So you just need to be, you know, ready to apply, submit your sort of horseman's resume. uh, And then February 15th, we'll announce accepted trainers and we'll be good to go for another year. So if you have any questions, there's a ton of resources on the RRP website at therrp.org under the third red makeover menu. And you can always email secretary at therrp.org if you have specific questions. Well, happy new year, Joy. Happy new year, Kristen. It feels weird, right? Because it's like it's so, so much of, <laughs> I feel like the winter is just like trying to get through it. And now mm-hmm. it's New Year's. So now is the time to, you know, turn over a new leaf, set your goals, plan ahead for 2023. So we asked our listeners um, for this episode if they had any particular New Year's resolutions. Um, and we ran that in a poll on our story on Instagram and on Facebook. So if you are not following us on social media, you need to get there and hang out with us because that's where we do all the cool stuff and share the feedback on the next episode. So um, our question was, Jobber wants to know, what is your New Year's resolution? Um, we had some really good responses. So uh, Instagram handle Bryce Taylor O said she wants to ride at least 50 new horses this year to improve her adaptability as a trainer. I love that. Awesome goal. That's yeah. a great goal. I'm yeah. terrified of that goal because I have a comfort zone with my horse. But I think right. it's a beautiful goal. 
I just don't know that many people with horses right now. Like at this stage of my horse life, I don't know 50 other people to be able to get on 50 new horses. So that's awesome. I'm you sure know, if, if Bryce situation. reached out to her local aftercare though, they would have some lined up for her. Yes. <laughs> and actually I'm looking closer. Bryce, Bryce may be a guy. So I apologize, oh, Bryce. Bryce, if, if you're a guy, I apologize. You. Yes. We're sorry. You know, the Instagram photo is about half an inch tall. It is very hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> but good luck, Bryce. We would love to hear more about that. So definitely send us a message. Let us know how that's going. That's like a horse a week, like a new horse a week. So. I love it. Maybe, maybe up it to 52, Bryce. Let us yeah, know if you accept yeah. my challenge. <laughs> All right. Instagram user a Dakota blonde says just spend more time existing with my horse, which is an awesome resolution. That's a beautiful goal. I think yes. mine's kind of aligning with that one, to be honest. Yeah. I'm kind of a fan of that one because mm-hmm. there's a lot of times where it's just easier to take the pressure off and enjoy the horse and remind yourself, you know, why we're doing this thing. Um, Hot girl summer dot OTTB. That's Woo-hoo. Finn. <laughs> we know that. That's <laughs> Lee and Finn. That was that's our, our 2022. Girl. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a girl. Uh, she was one of our featured makeover trainers from 2022. Uh, she says, <laughs> to abscess less, Finn, I hope. Oh, Finn. That's, a, that's a Finn, yes. Please, <laughs> yes. please yeah, we get that, that resolution for you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jessica Sackett adds, to be jobber when I grow up. That's a great goal. Jobber is awesome. We should all aspire to be more like jobber. So thank you. For I don't that, know Jessica. if jo- like jobber's ever been like a hero for someone, but now he finally can have that title. <laughs> he's finally, he's like, yes, finally someone recognizes my majesty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. Thank you, Jessica. That's You've just stolen one. jobber's ego even further. <laughs> and I know we had a him. response. He needs it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He really, he does not need a bigger ego. He is, he's not going to fit through the barn door here pretty soon. His ego is so big. <laughs> um, and I know we had a response on Facebook messenger, which I of course cannot find, but I know uh, we had a listener respond that their goal is to make it to the makeover, which is awesome. So if you are that listener, send us a message. Cause we would love to chat with you about your makeover goals for 2023. Yes. And who knows if you're accepted, you could be one of our spotlight writers. That's what I'm thinking. We would love who to have knows? listeners. So. Yes. Joy, what's your resolution? Do you have one? Oh, I actually have several, but I will not bore everyone with all of them. Um, so I'll, I'll do my top two. So I, on a reflective note, I feel like this year was kind of the key year for me and Astrid to solidify a connection that was consistent. Uh, she has been my hardest horse I've ever owned in my life. If you listen to the show, you will know that whole saga. There is always <laughs> content coming through with that horse. But well, Astrid, she's a special pickle. Um, but she's finally, I think, in a place of confidence with herself and her body and confidence with me kind of leading her. And I feel like I have more confidence to lead her. We, If you listen to another episode before this, which was our panel of the limited horse, I had a massive phobia of breaking my horse and I finally have overcome that. So this year, I really want to make about being intentional with our rides and having more strategy behind them to kind of get to where I initially imagined we would have been. So I want to get to training level and dressage consistently and hopefully compete at least once at that level. And then I also would really love to get her to some off sites. She has a phobia of the trailer. We will work through it. I am manifesting it. It's going to happen. We're going to get, at, yes, we're going to get to some off sites. I don't care what they are. It might just be going to my trainer's barn down the road. They do cross country schooling. So just taking her out to graze and hang out, whatever is the least stressful thing, but just getting her out and about is my goal for 2023. Maybe How about you? in the middle in Ohio somewhere and we'll go trail riding, you know? Ooh, yeah, maybe. Maybe if that I really, happen. that those confidence pants on her, her big girl pants, we'll get her to do that one. That'd we'll just fun. sandwich her between Jobber and Shorty. She'll be good to go. She does love the boys. Yeah, that'll be perfect. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Kristen? What are your, your goals for 2023? You know, I don't know. Yeah, like resolutions and goals. I think I, <laughs> I've i had this conversation before when, um, especially with Jen Royds. So Jen, if you're listening, this still troubles me to this day. <laughs> so <laughs> the difference between a resolution and a goal. So I tend to just choose goals rather than resolutions, which I think Jen explained to me, a resolution is like changing something in your life to have a particular outcome. And a goal is like a thing you want to achieve. So I tend to go with the things I want to achieve. I go with goals. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than like, you know, 
changing myself because I like who I am. So I was going to say like, y'all. my life is good. <laughs> yeah. You're stuck with me the way I am. <laughs> There's uh, a lot of issues, but I, I, I know these issues We're familiar now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. These are my pets. Leave them alone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so as far as goals, um, let's see, I think I chatted a little bit about this actually in our holiday panel last episode, uh, but I have been starting to work on my roping. So I would really like to catch a calf at our horse show series mm-hmm. um, and place in the ranch roping and just be a better, this is hard to quantify. I do like goals you can quantify, but just be a better overall roper at home um, to actually be useful around the farm. So right now we kind of do all of our farming based around like if we need to, we bring the herd down or we cut out the cows we need. Um, and if we could rope better, we would actually be a lot more effective at being able to you know, help cows and calves in need on the pasture without having to move the entire herd. So that would make us better ranch hands for sure. If we could rope a little better, um, it's a hard one to quantify to say rope better, but rope usefully might be a, <laughs> a better goal. Hey, I like it. I like <laughs> yeah, it. <laughs> actually be like a, be a better cowboy, I guess. <laughs> I think it's a <laughs> fun goal. goal. Also, it makes you more of a badass than me. So <laughs> it definitely sounds a lot more badass than it probably is. So yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> and you're already having to deal with one large animal and then you add another one into the mix and you're like, I'm going to rope it from the back of this other large animal. <laughs> yeah. This seems really safe. So yeah. it's really, and you know, really like jobber seems to inherently understand what he should be doing. So it, this is largely a personal goal. I just need to be able to catch better, catch on the fly, catch from weird angles, catch moving targets. Jobber just seems to know where to put himself, bless his heart. So once again, Jobber's ego is growing again (laughs) as this segment progresses. (laughs) Jobber knows he's a special unicorn and he's not afraid to flaunt it. Exactly. Yeah. So, (laughs) all right. All right, everybody, we're going to write all this down and we're going to revisit this episode at the end of 2023 and see how we did. How does that sound? 100%. And hey, as you're tackling these goals, it doesn't matter if you master it. We want to see your attempts. Please tag us. We want to see what you're doing, what you're working on, see how you're bonding with your horse, whether they're a thoroughbred, standard bread, or anything else. We don't care. We love them all. We would love to see what you're doing. Yep. Give us a follow at Retired Racehorse Radio on Instagram and Facebook. And yeah, give us a tag. Give us a shout out. We'd love to hear from you. Well, Joy, we're very excited today to have with us a uh, representation from Second Stride, which is another aftercare organization uh, based in Kentucky. So we're going to hear a little bit more from Kate Olson today. Kate Olson plans and coordinates the day-to-day fiscal, administrative, and operational activities at Second Stride. Her ongoing responsibility is keeping track of all of the adopted horses in a detailed database. And she also helps the rest of the organization with anything needed at any time, such as holding horses for pictures and posting on social media. Kate has worked in racing and aftercare for over 20 years. She holds a degree in respiratory therapy from the University of Louisville. Kate, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you all for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so I don't think we've ever had anyone from Second Stride on. So, of course, we're always interested to learn more about, you know, the various aftercare organizations working in the thoroughbred industry and what makes you guys unique. So tell us a little bit more about Second Stride, where you guys are based, um, you know, and some of the programs that you guys are doing. So we're based in Prospect, Kentucky. We have two farms um, in Prospect, and Prospect is about 12 miles northeast of Louisville, um, and about 15 from Churchill Downs. So right in the heart of uh, racing, the racing industry. Um, and we were started in 2005 um, due to owners and trainers contacting our founder, Kim Smith, um, about needing horses place. She had been working in um, the racing industry for a little bit and made some connections and they just would call her when they had a horse needing retired and she would find them a home through the Bargain Mart, which was a um, newspaper um, in Kentucky where you list of things you had for sale or adoption. Um, and eventually her accountant told her she had become a nonprofit and thus second stride began. So we just <laughs> awesome. sort of grew from there. Um, we started out adopting maybe 10, 15 horses a year. And last year we did 143. So Holy cow. Uh, about, wow. about 1400 since 2005. Oh, that's amazing. Quite a lot. Wow. Those are huge numbers. Oh, that's so cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We bring in about 130 to 
30 horses every year, the majority of whom are thoroughbreds. This year, we've brought in one quarter horse and one Percheron draft um, just as a little fundraiser. But um, the majority of them are all thoroughbreds. Nice. Oh. And they tend to come to you directly from their connections? Like people come, you know, like a, a race owner or a yeah. trainer? Nice. Correct. Yep. They're all donated and people will call or we have a donor form they can fill out online. Um, and once we get the information and a spot opens, we'll bring the horse in and assess it and find it a home. Nice. Um, and what's unique with you guys is you have this broodmare and bloodstock program, which is relatively new for you, right? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes. So officially, we started the program this year. Um, over the past four to five years, we would take in one to two broodmares a year. People would call us needing to place an older mare that they had, and we would take them as we had room available, um, but they would cost us quite a bit of money because they were normally with us several months versus the one or two months that the ones coming off the track are with us. And so we were limited in, in the amount of broodmares we could take. Um, so we, last year in 2021, we became a partner with the Right Horse Initiative uh, through the ASPCA and applied for a grant um, to help us fund the um, broodmare um, placements that we were doing. And we came up with a program called Broodmare and Bloodstock. So we will take in uh, retired broodmares looking for their third career after racing and being a mom. And the bloodstock is the um, yearling um, and youngsters uh, division of our program where we will take horses in that aren't um, confirmationally correct and won't make it to the racetrack. Uh, we'll bring those in as well. And uh, we owe it mostly all now to the ASPCA with the funding they've given us. Um, we've adopted this year, so far we've adopted six broodmares and four youngsters, so four yearlings um, that we've adopted overall. Wow. So it's been quite a successful program so far. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And that's a statistic that I don't think anyone really probably has a good handle on in my experience, but you mm -hmm. always hear about it, right? Of like, oh, well, you know, X percent of horses don't make it to the track. They don't even make their first mm -hmm. start. They don't start training. They don't whatever. Um, you know, so it's interesting to hear of like that. This is one of the first programs that's ever been on our radar. That's specifically helping those horses at need. Cause you always kind of wonder like, where do those horses go? <laughs> you know, not every horse is right. born with an athlete's build, unfortunately, even sure. in a breed right. as athletic right. as the thoroughbred. So that's really cool. So right. do these horses tend to have any issues that would, you know, predispose them to not being a good riding horse or it's, they just can't handle the rigors of racing, maybe confirmation. No, their, com their confirmation is pretty incorrect. So they wouldn't be able to withstand the rigors of racing, but they can go on and be a wonderful trail horse um, and dressage, um, hunter jumpers, anything like that. Once they're fully grown and you see how their legs are going to form eventually, um, that's when you can assess that. We market most of them to be um, a nice trail horse to start. And then once they're fully grown, if you get a vet's opinion, if they can be more athletic then certainly take them in that direction. But that's why we get most of them. The, the farms just um, have tried to get their legs correct and it's just not going to work or they don't, they don't see the point in doing so. So they send them our way and we keep them with us uh, for a while. We'll um, do some groundwork with them, you know, assess their behaviors, their tendencies, get them used to people, getting used to going out with older horses. And then once they are uh, big enough, we'll, we'll break them and put them under saddle and just walk and trot them a little bit and then eventually take them on little farm hacks around the farm. Oh, I love that. 
So that this is sounds like a great opportunity for anyone who, you know, is interested in a thoroughbred but doesn't want one that might have some racing wear and tear. Like all you blank slate Correct. thoroughbred people, this is your jam. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, okay, like yeah. it sounds like second stride has something for anyone who's yeah, looking mm-hmm. to adopt a thoroughbred. It doesn't have to be mm-hmm. with race experience. Or I personally lean towards the broodmares because they have a little bit more handling. They've come off the track, mm-hmm. most of them, or haven't been raced. And they're mm-hmm. a little older, so the mindset's a little different, but that's, I'm also mm-hmm. getting older and don't bounce the same. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So our, our brood mares are wonderful because as you say, they have been handled. Um, they've been living outside as well. Um, so they're used to being outside. They're used to being with other horses. They're used to the vet, the farrier, all that stuff. And most of them have very limited injuries, if any at all. And if they do have a past injury, it's been so long ago that it doesn't bother them. And once right. we get them rebroke, I mean, they, they remember everything after the first ride and they're ready to go. They remember, you know, they remember how to be ridden. Like it's riding a bike to us. They remember what it's like to have someone on their back. And we just, you know, assess their behavior from there and, they love to go out on farm hacks as well. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've, any thoroughbred has that thoroughbred work ethic. So they all want to have mm-hmm. some sort of a job. So, yeah, I bet they, they enjoy do. that. They do. Mm-hmm. So that must dovetail yeah. this program. You know, your program has been around obviously for a, a couple, well, a couple of years on officially and now, you know, officially for a year. Are you seeing any right. increased interest since the RRP announced oh, its broodmare division? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we are getting applications uh, one or two a week for our broodmares. Um, we only have one in the program right now um, and she's unfortunately not rideable, but um, the ones that we've had this year were not with us, but um a month or two. And then the last one we got in since the RRP announced their program has been adopted and she'll be leaving next week. So she's only been here, I think two weeks. So um, yeah, it's, it's going to help us out a lot. And our program is helping out the owners and trainers a lot. Um, Once we announced our program, we were inundated with um, um, applications for mayors to come in the program. Mm, Um, so that's a relief for us because we knew the need was out there. We just didn't have the money to help as much as we wanted. And now that we do, we can take so many more in and get them retrained for their third career. Oh, that's awesome. Lots of good synergy between all these different facets of aftercare Mm -hmm. working together. That's right. Right. Nice. Pause. Sorry, Joy. I ran out of steam. <laughs> I was wondering. It's okay. I, it's like, okay. I, I don't know where this is going. <laughs> well, I was going to ask. Um, so we talked a little bit about the new things coming in for, well, what's happening already with the broodmare and bloodstock. But I wanted to ask too of the adoption process so I can jump in with that. Okay, go ahead. Mm-hmm. If that works, Kate. <laughs> Yeah, this okay. is what happens, Kate. We run, a, we forget where we're going. <laughs> we get really in the weeds and stuff and forget like, oh, people have lives they have to get yeah. to as well. All right. <laughs> we'll let you jump back in. <laughs> okay. Back in in three, two, one. So Kate, we, we talked about several different options here at Second Stride and it sounds like there's a horse really for anybody who's looking can you tell us a little bit about the adoption process and how one can get approved to get a horse from Second Stride? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if you go on our website, secondstride.org, um, and click on Adopt a Horse, it'll bring up the list of everyone that's available for adoption. And at the bottom of each of their ad pages, you'll find the link to the application. And you fill that out online and we'll receive it. And it asks for a vet reference, trainer reference barrier reference and a boarding reference if you have one, Um, as well as some general questions if you have horse experience, if you've worked with off-track thoroughbreds before and things like that. And we'll we'll go through all that and contact your references. And if you're approved, we'll send you an email 
and then you can come out to make an appointment to look at any horse you would like. Um, and we also do adopt horses sight unseen. Um, we do adopt all over the country and some people just can't fly out here from out West uh, to see the horse. So we'll talk to them at length about the horse um, and make sure, you know, it, it'll, it'll be a good fit. And it's the type of horse they're looking for personality wise, athletic wise, trail wise, whatever. Um, and then, you know, the shipper will come and we'll get them on the van and they'll be on their way to their new home and uh, hopefully be retrained to do something a lot, um, lot, not, not better, but easier than racing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's lovely. I love to, I'm just going through the horses you have on your website, yeah, so am I. <laughs> the, you know, it's, it's a, the show enablement. It really is. But you also show who's RRP eligible. We talked in this episode about those who want to apply to be part of the makeover this coming year, that they don't have to have a horse in mind, but can still apply. Mm -hmm. So if you're still looking Mm -hmm. for a horse, this is a great time to check out Second Stride and see if there's a horse who could be a good fit for you. I'm looking at Mon Romeo. He's super cute. I don't need a three-year-old gelding in any way. But he is super lovely. Really, really cute. He's a handsome boy. That's for sure. I like yes. this one named Sinister. That's a little bit of an I looked at Sinister hand. too, and I'm like, I already have um, quite yeah. sprightly mare, and I feel like I'm inviting myself yeah. for issues with yeah. Sinister, but he's beautiful. You know, he I love is. a chestnut. Sinister so. came, yeah, Sinister came to us from Florida, and his name really doesn't suit him. He's a pretty laid back kind of guy. I was going to say, he's got though. such a soft eye in his photo. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know what he did to get his name, but we haven't seen any sign of it. <laughs> no, no. Oh, he's he cute. might be sinister for cookies in your pockets. That's probably what it, that's the worst right. he's yeah, going to be. be. Right. <laughs> yeah. But well, Mon Romeo is the life of the party. He's not only good looking and flashy, but he has a good time. So um, unfortunately, his injury limits him to just being a trail horse, but he's going to make the best looking trail horse ever. No. Well, he's super lovely. I mean, I, I'm just a flat rider anyway. I'm scared to jump over yeah. a cross pole. So <laughs> may, maybe he could be my next horse. Who knows? Who knows? Indeed. But uh, yeah. yes. yes. Well, Kate, thank you so much for joining us and sharing everything that you're doing at Second Stride. It really is a unique aftercare organization and you're doing some wonderful work there. Uh, we wish you all the success for this coming year and the years to come. And if people want to check you out, you just go to secondstride.org. And if you adopt from there, any of our listeners, please let us know. We would love to be tagged and then share it with Kate so she knows that she helped be a part of that. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you all so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, typically we have Leandra Cooper joining us from New Vocations for this segment, but unfortunately she did get quite ill before this recording. So you all are stuck with me. I'm sorry. I know I'm not as good as Leandra, but I'm still going to bring you an adoptable horse that I think you'll be excited about from New Vocations. So today we're bringing you Hang Fire. He is a 2017 gelding, 16 so a great size for everyone. And he's a gorgeous bay. He has a nice structure, really solidly built, and a very kind eye. I was instantly drawn to this horse when I saw him. And while he only has a little bit of chrome as a cute star in his face, I think you'll be surprised when you look at his photos of how handsome he is and how easy your eye will be drawn to him. He, well, they call him Hank at New Vocations, and they describe him as easily led to and from from the field or with a buddy, and he's a very patient, well-mannered horse, and he loves standing at cross ties, loves attention, loves being groomed, uh, and he stands well for the vet and farrier too, so a true gentleman for sure. He does wear front shoes and may require a little bit of gut supplementation, but don't let that fool you. He is here as a straightforward ride. He's here to please. When I look at Hank and I watch his videos, I easily see him as being a great horse for anyone who's looking to do level hunters, maybe low level dressage. He's just got a nice solid build. He doesn't have a too big of a wither or anything. It's just really solid across the board, nice square chunky frame, which I personally really like in a horse. Um, He goes out and is very enthusiastic about life. And he honestly just seems like a very down to earth guy. Uh, He's 
definitely got some notable pedigrees in there from Northern Dancer and Tappet, AP Indie, Unbridled. So he's he's got a nice well-bred and he actually didn't start. He was unraced. So for anyone who's looking for an unraced uh, youngster, maybe Hang Fire is the one for you. So you can check him out at horseadoption.com. He is a super high fee of $2,500. Yes, I know. Outrageous. No, he really truly is. Looks like a gentleman. Check out his videos, his images, get your application in because they do go like a cot chips at new vocations. They will go very fast. But if hang fire is not available, or maybe he wasn't the horse you were looking for, don't worry. There are lovely horses at new vocation and there's definitely one for you. So check them out. Horseadoption.com. You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on the website at retiredresourceradio.com. Like us on Facebook and Instagram, just search for Retired Resource Radio. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. You can find me on Instagram at The Horseback Writer and on Twitter at Kristen Kovach. My email is kbentley at the rrp.org. You can find me on Instagram at misfitmare and my email is joy at horseradionetwork.com. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Kentucky Performance Products and Cashel Company, and to our wonderful partners, New Vocations Adoption Program and the Retired Racehorse Project. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network, part of Equine Network at horseradionetwork.com. Remember to set your goals high and love to learn from every ride. And add more leg. Bye, guys. Bye.